Hello everyone. So today we look at hypertension. So hypertension is shown in this, in this diagram. Um, as you already know, hypertension is high blood pressure, isn't it? So high blood pressure uh, can be contributed by various factors. So for example, there's constriction, vasoconstriction, and over constriction of the <clears throat> of the smooth muscle walls and smooth muscles in the blood vessel wall. Right, it can be due to overload of fluid, for example, and etc. etc. So this a uh, nice picture actually summarizes all the factors, <laughs> all the possible contributing factors like stress, for example. Obviously, when you're stressful, your pressure goes up. Genetically as well, and your sympathetic activation, <laughs> which then links to your increase in heartbeat and so on. And also sodium retention, which again shows the importance of your renal contribution, which whereby the drug would actually act in this section as well. And also the gastro, uh, in terms of, this is more on the indirect way with your obesity and alcohol, which also increases the pressure. And also the endocrine contribution. Right, and obviously with old age, it loses the elasticity and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so due to its multifactorial, so obviously we need, to, we need multiple drugs um, with different targets to actually tackle the problem especially those when single monotherapy doesn't work. So you can actually use drugs which targets different sections and different portions of it uh, to that hit a better therapeutic outcome. So again, uh, high blood pressure. So uh, again, you can do exercise. It's also important to reduce your pressure long term. So the class will go through the basic backgrounds of pathogenesis and so on and also with different drugs. So it's kind of a longer kind of class because there's lots of drugs in, uh, as antihypertensive. And also bear in mind that uh, the drugs that we go through here, we won't really go through it uh, in very detail again in other classes because obviously the same drug will have the same mechanism of, of action. But it will have different hemodynamic effects i.e. how it affects the whole uh, blood circulation system or cardiovascular system to achieve the effect that you want in a particular disease condition. And the main thing or main tricky part about the overall cardiovascular diseases is about which drug to use when because there's so many options for you. So, um, and overall, like for all the drugs in the class of uh, antihypertensive agents, they all reduces the blood pressure. Right, but then there's a few of them which are actually shown to have a better effect and reduces the hot rate of hospital hospital hospitalization, for example, or to reduce the mortality of the patient. So therefore, those drugs with better clinical evidence will be used uh, more commonly clinically. When obviously you need to know which is the best to use in which specific patient condition, and also um, why do you use certain combinations. Um, uh, it could be based on its pharmacological action, uh, <clears throat> which then uh, reduces the compensatory effect. And there's also specific hy uh, hypertension conditions like a preeclampsia and so on, which will be uh, talked about in other, in other slides. So in the, the case for Malaysia, uh, there's actually a few more recent guidelines, thank goodness, um, so which actually summarize what happens overseas as well. So you can refer to any other guidelines as long as they're recent enough. So... Um, then uh, the information is pretty uh, updated. So um, do spend some time to read through the guidelines. It will help you tremendously in your case study assignments and also the exams and quizzes as well. Please read. Okay, so uh, in summary, what's hypertension? So hypertension, we need something called repeated measurements of blood pressure. It's not just per isolation case, but it has to be repeated. Uh, and it's consistently high blood pressure. So uh, diagnosis per se, uh, it could take some time because of it. So because there could be white coat syndrome and so on and so forth. So it might, which may require some 24 hour monitoring, for example, or some time for the patient to actually go back home to measure, uh, to use their own <clears throat> blood pressure machine uh, to measure a few times and then to show the results to the doctor during the next visit. Um, to then show that, yes, it is a confirmed case of hypertension. Right, so uh, it can be different classes. Uh, in this case, depends on the severity, of course. So um, if they are, the cutoff here is about, uh, <clears throat> if it's less than 160 over 100, so obviously this is a systolic blood pressure and also the diastolic one. If it's more than 160 or over 100, then you might start thinking maybe you should try uh, to initiate the drug treatment um, and if not then maybe you can 
give it wait a little bit of time, right? And the main thing, no matter whether they're on drug treatment or not, they need to be uh, given uh, advice on the non-pharmacological management because it's shown to be uh, pretty effective and uh, useful in uh, <clears throat> to augment the drug effect anyway, right? So follow up and again, obviously to monitor the compliance as well and see how responsive is the person towards uh, the drug treatment. And besides that, obviously, to look at the other risk factors as well, which we'll go through later. <clears throat> so there's different stages of hypertension. As you can see here, there's mild, moderate, severe. And there's also cases with isolated uh, systolic hypertension, which is more common in elderly people. Uh, see my mom. <laughs> right, her, her systolic is high, but diastolic is really low. Uh, the diastolic can be like, 670 <laughs> right so um so there's different um classes of people as you can see here so our main aim uh, in the whole healthcare system is obviously to reduce and keep people as many people as in the optimal or normal blood pressure range right with lesser on the higher range right so therefore hopefully there'll be less complications for people that may end up they may cause them to end up in the hospital Okay, and this one is uh, some of the guidelines also, which is uh, part of the guide. Uh, sorry, these are some of the recommendations from the guideline about the home monitoring, um, home BP monitoring. As you can see here, um, the cutoff is a bit lower in a way, but again, they'll be monitored in the clinic as well. So it can be a, a double confirmation um, before the actual diagnosis is being made. And make sure the patient has to be measured um, when they're purely resting form, right, and relax so that the pressure will be as close to as normal condition as possible. Right, so uh, this is just a little bit diagram to explain the, the effects on obesity on the overall cardiovascular system. So when you look at cardiovascular system, it's basically here, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and also heart failure at the top. So obesity, yes, it has a huge effect. Right, so therefore, if you can ask the patient to reduce the weight a little, even a little bit, uh, it will cause tremendous effects on the overall health of the patient because uh, obesity increases uh, lipos, uh, adipocytes, so reduces the adipokines, right, so which uh, reduces the mild inflammation around in the body, right, and therefore indirectly re uh, causes all these things, right. So if there's increase of adipocytes, increase of adipokines, all this will happen. So why do we need to treat hypertension? So <clears throat> the main thing is that it causes a lot of long-term and it's also irreversible uh, effects, right? Side effects in a way uh, or damaging effects. So it, it's not just towards the heart. Um, it's also like stroke, right? And you can see it's, it's ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, both included. Retinopathy, Right, because a uh, high pressure towards the uh, the <clears throat> weakened vessels walls in the small vessels, and also the small vessels in not just in the eye but also in the kidney, right? So in the brain in this case. So all this in, in combination um, is what we try to prevent because um, it is it reduces the morbidity of the patient tremendously. So if you don't like things in diagram, you can look at in chart form. So this is it. So again, these are different uh, how it can be done, it can be monitored or um, it can be shown clinically, right? So another diagram here to show, so why do we need to reduce the pressure? Because even mild reduction in it has shown to reduce the percentage uh, in mortality tremendously. It's proven clinically, so uh, that's why uh, physicians or cardiologists are doing, or even uh, any doctors are trying very hard to reduce the blood pressure for long term. Uh, but bear in mind there's also uh, something called secondary hypertension, right? So therefore, um, you can see that there's some of it are drug related as well. So it's good to review the medications as well for the patient. So they could either reduce the dose or to stop it, or if it's just a shorter term treatment, um, maybe just to use uh, antihypertensive uh, for a shorter period of time. So if you can treat <coughs> the 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 other causes over here, like thyroid disease, like hyperthyroidism, causes hypertension. If you can treat these diseases, then treat them because indirectly you will treat the hypertension as well because these are the cause of the hypertension for some patients. 
Right, so um, this again uh, lists down the drugs which are commonly linked to hypertension, as you can see here. So all this again, uh, it's not just one per drug, meaning you just take it one time, once, and then the pressure will drop, it will increase a lot, that you need treatment, no, uh, we're talking about a more longer term consumption or usage, right, so just bear in mind if the patient is taking all this. Again, that's risk stratification, so um, it's it's gonna it's also shown in other sites as well. So TOD is target organ damage, uh, TOC target organ complication. Details you can see in the next few slides. So again, uh, if there's very high risk, as you can see here, if the person already experienced um, previous episodes of myocardial infarction (MI) for is or ischemic heart diseases, previous stroke, already have diabetes or uh, chronic kidney diseases. So the risk is very, very high for them. So you need to control the pressure, to keep the pressure at a much lower level, right? <clears throat> if not, um, it's going to be obviously not good for the patient at all. So um, these are the risks for the patient. So we should, again, determine the target that you want to hit. So obviously, the higher the pressure is not good to anyone. Right. So in terms of the management, uh, as referred to the table just now, so if it's very high or even if it's just medium and above, so you need drugs needs to step in and obviously healthy living. So healthy living includes uh, anything like salt intake, physical activity, alcohol and so on and so forth. <laughs> right. So as mentioned here, because this already shown that if you uh, actually have uh, non-pharmacological um, advices or activities, so it actually reduces the systolic pressure in quite a significant amount as well. Okay, let's go for the treatment. So this is an older one. So normally we try to keep it one in general one the one three o slash eighty. If there's high risk, if not about one four o ninety, it's okay. -ish. But uh, remember, cardiovascular is a field which is being studied extensively. There's lots of studies ongoing all the time. So uh, guidelines and all this could change over time very, very quickly. So again, please refer to the most latest one. But in general, even though the guidelines changes, there's still the drugs that the gold standard for drugs still maintain about similar for the past few years. So we'll go through them, the major classes of antihypertensive agents. So the first class, um, <clears throat> so actually the easy way to remember is ABCD. So A refers to the ACE inhibitor, as you can see here. ACE inhibitor group, i.e. mainly the renin angiotensin system. B refers to your beta blockers, which is mainly here, your beta 1 antagonist. C for your calcium channel blockers over here. And D is your diuretics in general. Right, so the diuretics one, because it's quite standalone in a way, so we're going to talk about it in a, in a different class altogether. Right, so... Um, <clears throat> So besides knowing the mechanism of action, this is what we call the hemodynamic effects. So hemodynamic effects, it's as summarized over here for all the drugs. So for example, if you look at the A per se, so your A is over here. So basically it reduces the venous tone. Therefore, it reduces your preload, reduces your stroke volume. Therefore, reduce your cardiac output, which then contributes to a reduction in blood pressure. Right, so, um, and etc. As, as the others follow on. So, um, and you've got B, you can see there's effects on the reduction in contractility and reduction in the heart rate, which then eventually goes all the way up. Uh, your D will be over here, which is your uh, sodium or water retention, which then reduces the preload, da da da, all the way up. So, these are the effects of your, and your CCB is over here, right? of um, the hemodynamic effects that we're talking about, right? So um, if the question asks about it, so please refer to this slide, right? So because that will actually explain how does all these drugs reduces blood pressure. So uh, this is again to show a little bit about the factors that modulate renin release. And remember, renin is the first one which converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. I'm pointing this out because um, you can see a familiar fellow over here, which is your, uh, sorry, renin's over here. Yes, your beta-1 receptors are, is over here. So you can see, um, i.e. beta blockers um, act also uh, affect the renin release indirectly as well. Uh, so it also affects the RAS system as well, not just pure effect on the heart only, right? This is just to remind you all about this. 
uh, there's also some other targets like adenosine and PG receptors which could be used as a target as well, uh, a drug target later on. Uh, there's also drugs under clinical investigation. Right, so um, RAS, if you look through, so this is a, a more like a flow chart for it. So depends which way is more useful for you for your revision, just go ahead. So angiotensin 2 per se has multiple effects. Uh, adrenal cortex itself, you know, proximal tubule inc to increase sodium reabsorption. So when it increases sodium reabsorption, it increases the water reabsorption as well because the, um, the renal function per se, we cannot control water absorption per se most of the time because water follows the sodium ions, right? So it's a, an after effect in a way. Right, um, but angiotensin 2 also have direct effects on the renal arterioles for uh, vessel constriction and also on the thirst system. And also, obviously, it's also the downstream for the aldosterone production as well. Right, so do know the effects of angiotensin 2 because obviously, if you inhibit uh, the ACE uh, enzyme or you inhibit the receptor over here, you inhibit or reduce the effects of all this. Right? So this is another, again another diagram to show the effects of angiotensin 2. So as you can see here, why is ACE or angiotensin 2 a good drug in a way? Because it's not just a reduction in blood pressure by a rapid response, meaning a direct, uh, <clears throat> if you want to inhibit it, a direct inhibition of the vasoconstriction. Or you inhibit it, uh, it actually reduces the sodium reabsorption over here for the slow pressure response. And if you inhibit angiotensin 2, it also inhibits this effect, which is called uh, the remodeling effect. So meaning there's hypertrophy and remodeling of the cardiac, of the heart per se. So this effect is actually quite unique because it's more specific towards the RAS uh, system or the angiotensin 2 system. So uh, it's not towards CCB or not towards D or diuretics. Um, so therefore, this angiotensin 2 targeting drugs either your ACE inhibitor or ARB will also be used uh, in conditions of heart failure as well because this is a very valuable drug because not every or any drug can actually uh, help the process of cardiac remodeling because bear in mind if there's any remodeling process uh, it involves the changes in the structure or modifying the changes of the structure of the heart so drugs in a way we could not reverse such a change we can only stop the progression of the change of it, right? Okay. Mm. Okay, so here we look at um, the angiotensin 2 as mentioned. How does angiotensin 2 exert its effects? So it actually has to activate, bind and activate the receptors called AT1 receptor. So um, actually it also has AT1 and AT2 receptors, but the one detrimental is actually the AT1 receptors. So uh, and also bear in mind the, the, the way it's being written. So somehow angiotensin 1 or 2 is written in the Roman way like the one and two, two strokes. But uh, for the receptor per se, it's the normal one, two, three that we write about, right? So <clears throat> um, there's also some renal hemodynamic effects. So you can read through over here, but also bear in mind, uh, there's some rare contraindications of the uh, ACE inhib inhibitor or ARB, which is this bilateral renal artery stenosis. It's rare, fortunately. Um, and, but the thing is because it relies on um, the effects of angiotensin 2 to maintain the pressure or the perfusion so uh, to the renal, to the kidneys so if you stop it um, the renal blood flow will be terribly affected so it's a rare contraindication for the drug right <clears throat> so how do we target the system so we can use renin inhibitor but it's not really used clinically uh, there's ACE inhibitor Right, and you can use it as the AT1 receptor antagonist. So again, it reduces all the effects of the angiotensin 2 that you didn't want. So bear in mind, there's another arm of it, which is uh, over here, whereby the ACE uh, enzyme is actually not as specific. It can also act on bradykinin, uh, whereby to cause the breakdown of bradykinin. So bradykinin is actually good in a way whereby it also causes vasodilation, which is what you want. Right, so therefore, if you inhibit uh, the breakdown of bradykinin, it actually causes more vasodilation effects, 
i.e. more reduction in blood pressure. But then uh, bear in mind that uh, the accumulation of bradykinin also contributes to the side effects of the ACE inhibitor, which is a annoying dry cough. So it's pretty common in a way, uh, not really common. Depends on how you define common, but uh, it's about say 10% or less uh, for people who experience dry cough. So if they just started with ACE inhibitor and they have dry cough, uh, you can you can you have to investigate to see if it's actually caused by the drug per se. Right? So we look at the next group, so which is the renin inhibitor. So aliskirin is the drug for it, but the thing is um, theoretically it should be potent, right? Because it's the one which targets the upstream of it, so you prevent any of the downstream effects of the angiotensin 2 pathway. Um, but <clears throat> it's not very favorable because the clinical efficacy is not great causes all sorts of side effects as well, right? So um, so we look more into ACE inhibitor. So from the name, it's actually a lot of brills, uh, med medical, medicinal chemistry, Lee. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but anyway, um, it can be available as an active drug per se or an active metabolite. So the metabolite, if they're active ones, is if you just add a lat, pre lat instead of a pril, right, it's for the name. So, um, so for some of it, it's actually as an active drug, but there's no active metabolite. So uh, clinically, the more commonly used ones are like perinopril, right, ramipril, inalapril, lisinopril. So these are the, the more commonly used clinically ones. So it's the first line because as mentioned, if you target this pathway, it actually reduces the, or it stops the uh, remodeling effect, which is quite rare. It's a, it's a rare benefit because not all drugs has it. Right, so um, there's again the dry cough as mentioned. So like any other antihypertensive agent, uh, it could cause first dose hypotension. So probably the body needs a few, day, uh, one or two days to just adjust the, or up to a week to adjust to it. Right, it may cause a little bit of hyperkalemia because it reduces the aldosterone synthesis. So here we look through the ARB, which is the angiotensin receptor blocker. So as mentioned just now, there's 81 and 82. So over here, as you can see, 82 activation actually is what we want in a way because it actually causes vasodilation. So it's good that we only target or antagonize 81 receptors. So, yep. So the main difference in a way is that uh, because it's specific towards the receptor, you have nothing to do with the bradykinin pathway, so therefore uh, you won't have the annoying dry cough side effects. So it's quite simple in a way that if someone has do experience dry cough from the uh, ACE inhibitor, you just switch them to ARB. So there's a lot of the sartans in a way for the name. So we've got candesartan, irbosartan, losartan, valsartan, tomisartan. So these are the few more commonly used ones in the clinic. Um, so it comes to the question that someone may ask, is it better if you actually just start the patient on ARB rather than ACE inhibitor? Because in a way, ACE inhibitor, you might want to see, oh, do you have dry cough or not? To see the suitability of the drug to the person. So, uh, but however, this happens this few years, last year, this year, last year, whereby, sorry for the side, the sound. So, um, you can actually, there's some recall of the sartans. It's nothing to do with the drug per se. It's actually due to the manufacturing process that unexpectedly you get these nitrosamine impurities, right? So the concentration is a little bit high, but um, it's supposed to be uh, pro-cancer in a way. But actually the, the studies already showed that you actually need to take it for like a high dose or you actually, or you have to take it for... Don't know, I think it was, oh, excuse me, sorry for thunder. So uh, quite a few years, like 10 years or 20 to actually see the effects. Um, but nevertheless, the drug is being recalled for certain batches. So this might discourage people to start on the satans, um, yeah, in this case in a way. Right, so let's move on to the next one, the next group, uh, which is the B for beta blockers. So the information here is actually uh, not very complete in a way because um, it's covered in your peripheral nervous system class already. And uh, please look through the Lange book or you can look through the information on the BNF as well. Right, so uh, beta blocker is a giant group, right? <clears throat> giant, giant group. So uh, a lot of examples. So some of it, uh, but... Do bear in mind you should know which are cardioselective, 
right? And which has intrinsic sympathetic music activities and so on, right? Uh, and because some of the doses could be different under different conditions as well. So uh, for again, for if it's the hemodynamic effects, you can just refer to the earlier slide. Sorry, my my boy, right? So uh, basically, it has negative ionotropic effects. It reduces the heart contractility and the heart rate. And also don't forget the inhibition on the renin secretion as well. So if you can answer those questions, you're fine. Some of the answers, like you can find it over here. Right, as you can see, some of the uh, beta blockers are non-specific. As you can see over here, propranol, nadolotimolol. Right, um, <clears throat> there's also some towards alpha. One antagonist as well. You can see cover the law there. And some are partial agonists. Some uh, beta-1 selective ones. Some with really short half-life, like x -molor. So this is the very short half-life ones are actually available in, in liquid form where you can give it as IV, so it can reverse or have uh, the effects can kick in really, really quick. Right, so another diagram here, another chart uh, to show the effects of the different uh, beta blockers as well. You can go through on your own. And bear in mind, there's few, just a few of them actually have additional benefits of beta blockers. As you can see here, some of them could have uh, a little bit of antioxidant antioxidant effects and, and things like that, a little bit of NO. So you can see from the chart which of it, so you can see a few famous further like Carvedilol, which appears in a few places here, here and here, right, and so on. Right, so just do your revision as usual. Right, so overall that probably has a greater effects on the reduced in reducing the blood pressure but again a lot of things again you have to rely on the clinical benefits and clinical evidence as well right so there's calcium channel blocker so calcium channel blocker appears uh, in different different classes as well similar like a and b group of drugs so for the ccb per se uh, it actually affects the contraction so here i actually go through a few of it Right, so the contraction of the effects of CCB actually affects on the L-gated uh, calcium channel uh, for the contraction. So uh, <clears throat> all these effects is on the smooth muscle cells, the vascular smooth, uh, smooth, muscle, cells, uh, smooth muscle cells to be precise. Right, so uh, when this uh, inhibition of the L-type uh, voltage-gated calcium channels, you reduce the calcium entry into the cells, into the smooth muscle cells, right? And, okay, okay reduction of the calcium, sorry for the pause, uh, actually prevents, uh, reduces the formation of the calcium carmodulin complex, which then reduces the phosphorylation of the uh, myosin-like chain kinase, um, and also the phosphorylation of myosin-like chain. So therefore, there's lesser production of this uh, acting myosin cross bridge, which then causes lesser contraction if you inhibit this. Right, uh, this is just to show you the effects of NO, which is uh, another drug which is mainly used in the angina condition, which is nitric oxide. So basically when you look at it, it's a direct activation of guanyl cyclase, right, which then eventually causes uh, more phosphatases uh, activation, so which then causes more relaxation of, uh, from the myosin-like chain, right? I'm sorry, you can actually see this drug in the, uh, to be used in other types of uh, hypertension conditions. So calcium channel blocker is much more straightforward in a way. You have three main classes, so based on their effects and also the chemical structures. Right, you've got phenylalkylamine, uh, phenylalkylamine sorry, um, which has only one example, which is verapamil. This is cardioselective, so mean, meaning it only acts on the smooth vascular smooth muscle cells in the heart. Uh, benzo... Oh, sorry, this is a bit too small on my screen. So we've got the second group, which is diltazam, which is inter intermediate in terms of its selectivity. It acts on the cardiac and also the smooth muscle cells in the blood vessels. But the more commonly used ones for the hypertension condition is actually this dihydropyridines. Uh, so these are all the dipins, dipins. As you can see, these are vascular select. Uh, selective so you can see the more commonly used one is actually amlodipine over here so how does it achieve the selectivity is actually towards the different subgroups uh, of the calcium channels of the alpha 1 subunit to achieve it 
So um, there's some side, common side effects of the hydropyridines like flushing, but tangles it will appear, it will disappear after a few days. And so a little bit of ankle sweat, uh, swelling, if it's severe, you can actually use uh, diuretics a little bit and it will go away. Right, so uh, this is just to show the newer drug, new in a way, um, just because it's a uh, more purer pure form. <laughs> Sorry, so basically amlodipine per se, uh, as shown just now, is actually a race mix mixture of R and S. So, but the active form is the S one. So, some company in China, it's actually by a China company, um, actually purify it. So, to call it Livamlodipine. So, this Livamlodipine is basically it's a purified form of S amlodipine. So, uh, so it basically acts the same way as amlodipine as mentioned just now. There's also other drugs called alpha-1 blockers, which are also used in the treatment of antihypertensive, like prazosin, afuzosin, and so on. So uh, the, the biggest benefit of it is a very old drug. So as mentioned just uh, now, there's a lot of drugs which can reduce the blood pressure, but there's not many that can actually um, reduce the mortality long term. So one of it is over here, so the alpha-1 blocker. So, but it's still useful for people to be uh, burning prostate hyperplasia if the, the older men actually have it. Oh, sorry. Lap thunder. mama here. Right, so um, therefore, actually, um, so if you use alpha 1 blockers for this group of patients, you actually have double benefit because it's a drug that can target both situations. Right? <clears throat> Right, so uh, caution. So again, just to be cautious, if because this this will, this drug won't be the first line of using it. So just to measure, just as any other drug, if you start a combination therapy, you have to measure the blood pressure so that the drug isn't too much that you want. Okay, right. So and uh, the for alpha one blockers, one of the main uh, issues is the drowsiness, and also the postural hypotension. So which could also be slightly dangerous to older people because again in dizzy there's higher risk of falling because they might have pre-existing osteoporosis. Right? So some information over here as well. <clears throat> so in this particular slide, so just go through a little bit how and why we choose a certain drug for a certain patient. So one of the reasons is based on the comorbidity that the person is having. Right, so as you can see here, um, ACE inhibitor ARB has mentioned again and again. So there's cardioprotective and also a little bit of renal protective effect, right? Uh, the renal protective too. So, um, so therefore, it can be used for people with already have some renal conditions, but obviously if it's advanced renal failure, you can't use it uh, because again, it affects the blood flow in the, in the kidney already. Right, so some of it are over here as well as mentioned. Right, so again, all this you, you have to refer to the more current guidelines. So some of you have uh, certain comorbidities as mentioned, so you can actually use any of such, right? So basically, uh, you might want to top up the drug one by one, but again, there's also more later evidence which says that if the pressure is too high, you can start with two drugs at the same time, uh, at the same time, and to more any, but no matter how, you still need to monitor the patient's condition and to measure uh, the blood pressure of the patient as well. Right, so here is to mention another reason why we need to use certain combinations, not just any combinations that you want it to be, uh, because there's a compensatory effect. So our body is too clever as usual. So any drug that you use, your body will say, hey, this might be too low the effect that you want it to be. So we want to compensate back to the normal baseline, which we want it to be. <clears throat> So, um, so when you have a pharmacological intervention, so there's a reduction in blood pressure, right? So you have reflexes, uh, either from the baroreceptor reflex, right? Okay, uh, which then increases the sympathetic effects, or from the renal section, which is the RAAS version, to eventually cause an increase in blood pressure. So therefore, if you want to use a combination of a drug, it's good to combine those from the sympathetic end with the others one from this end, right? Okay, so to continue, so like for just now, it's another. this is just another one to show the compensatory effects. So we try to block it from different aspects as mentioned just now. 
Right, so this is again diagram to show you how we can combine here again. So uh, this is from the Malaysian guidelines. So you can see um, when we can combine them and what pa patient population has it been studied. So you don't get three pluses for diuretics for the other groups of people, right? Um, the ACE inhibitor will always be the three pluses, right? So the diuretics also three plus for heart failure because it reduces the congestive symptoms or i.e. the edema for the patients as well, right? So, yep. So a little bit of info here and there. So, yep. So again, all this information differs along. So this is again to show you uh, some combinations to be used with caution. So what you need to monitor for the patient, right? So that's all for today. See you again in another class. Stay safe, stay healthy, and happy, of course.